Hello, my name is Nate Looker. I am a research soil scientist with the Soil Health Institute. I want to share a bit about the work we've been doing to improve the relevance of soil health measurements for farmers and other decision makers over broad areas. I'll give you an overview of our approach to benchmarking soil health and highlight a few details about the sampling framework that my colleagues listed here and I are submitting soon for peer-reviewed publication. We often get questions like these from farmers and ranchers, and this is one of the major motivations for our work on soil health measurements. We want to be able to help growers answer these questions to clear up some of the uncertainty about how their soils might respond to management changes, such as reductions in tillage or cover cropping. Being able to generalize our understanding of soil health across locations within a region is important so that our work is relevant for larger numbers of growers as well as for the people who work with growers, such as crop consultants, ag retailers, commercial soil labs, extension agents, and conservation organizations. At national to continental scales, comparing soil health measurements and understanding management effects on, soil, on soils across multiple regions is a priority. Evidence of how practice changes have affected soil health in areas with higher rates of practice adoption are invaluable for understanding what innovations might be possible in areas where practice changes have been limited or relatively short-lived. This cross-regional perspective can also help inform economic or voluntary policy mechanisms to reduce barriers to practice adoption. When we talk about the effects of management on soil health, we need to be concrete about how we quantify soil health. There are dozens of different soil health measurements out there, and many provide complementary information about the multiple facets of soil functioning. Based on the North American Project to Evaluate Soil Health Measurements, or NAPSHM, the Soil Health Institute recommends soil organic carbon concentration, carbon mineralization potential, and aggregate stability as a minimum suite of measurements that are responsive to management, affordable, and practical to measure at scale. The study sites in NAPSHM were long-term agricultural experiments, which are the gold standard for linking management changes to soil health dynamics. Here we're looking at soil organic carbon measurements for a corn soil alfalfa study in southwestern Minnesota. The side-by-side -side comparisons of management systems in experiments like this help ensure that the same soil type is being compared, and having multiple observations for each management system lets us separate the effects of management on soil health measurements from the influence of local variation and factors that aren't affected by management, like soil texture. Outside of research settings, one time-tested strategy for pinpointing the effects of management on soils has been to compare adjacent management systems or land uses. Comparing paired locations in the same slope position and within the same general geographic location or site helps account for natural variation, so differences in soil health measurements can be more directly attributed to management. Measurements of soils under undisturbed perennial vegetation can be particularly helpful because they give us a snapshot of soil's potential health when they're given enough time to develop good structure and active microbial communities. Paired comparisons between cropland and perennial vegetation on the same soil type are not possible in many highly productive landscapes, where nearly all available land is under crop production. Here we're looking at a portion of the Mississippi alluvial plain in eastern Arkansas. If we wanted to compare the location indicated by the point in this rice field, the perennial vegetation, we'd have to go two kilometers away or farther to find a potential comparison, but we may end up on a different soil type. When we zoom out from individual sites to regional, national, or continental scales, we start to see that factors other than management have a stronger influence on in soil health measurements. Here we're looking at soil organic carbon measurements across all 124 sites included in NAPSHM. The data for the research site in Minnesota we looked at earlier are outlined in red. The effects of management on soil organic carbon within sites are generally much smaller than the differences we see across sites and across regions due to factors such as precipitation, temperature, soil texture, and soil mineralogy. Soil scientists have been studying how broad-scale variation in climate gives rise to regions of similar soils since the beginning of soil science as a discipline. We can leverage this understanding in our efforts to link soil health measurements to management within and across regions. To provide different stakeholders with actionable interpretations of soil health and decision support tools, SHI is working to quantify the effects of management on soil health over broad areas, with on-farm soil health surveys currently underway in the United States and Canada. Improving our understanding of the factors other than management that determine potential soil health across sites and regions is a major component of this work. A primary goal of our regional soil health surveys is to, is to develop quantitative benchmarks that represent levels of soil health that are achievable for a specific soil in a particular region. Growers can use these benchmarks to set soil health goals that make sense for their context and production system. These goals need to be applicable over broad areas so that they are relevant to larger numbers of growers. 
We've also prioritized developing a benchmarking framework that can be adapted for projects with different objectives, limited budgets, and in different regions. And we have focused on non-soil scientists as end users of this framework. These are the different steps we take to benchmark soil health across our different projects. Today we'll take a more detailed look at the first couple steps and briefly discuss how we present benchmarks after sampling, lab measurements, and data analysis are complete. For more details about our sampling approach, this QR code will take you to a standard operating procedure on SHI's website. To map soils that we expect to have similar potential health and choose which soils to sample, we've developed a concept we call the Soil Health Sampling Group. A soil health sampling group consists of a unique combination of soil texture, natural drainage class within a physiographic region. This is similar to the soil management group concept developed in Michigan in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, but we've designed soil health sampling groups so they can be mapped using a wide range of traditional soil surveys or digital soil map products. For soil health sampling groups, we classify soil texture using a six class system to strike a balance between conventional systems with 12 or more classes and the simplified coarse medium fine classification sometimes used for soil health interpretation. This same system is used to classify soil families in U.S. soil taxonomy, but here we are applying it to the uppermost mineral horizon. Soil health sampling groups are defined by combining soil texture with a simplified classific classification of drainage class. These drainage classes represent the likelihood that a soil's natural moisture dynamics will impair plant growth. Here we are looking at soil health sampling groups mapped across the contiguous United States and Canada. These maps are derived from traditional soil surveys, including Surgo in the U.S. and provincial soil surveys in Canada. The black outlines show the regional units we use to define soil health sampling groups. These are the major land resource areas in the U.S. and ecoregions in Canada. There are some gaps in Canada due to limited soil survey availability, but the major crop producing regions are shown here. This gives you an idea of the level of simplification we achieve when we use the soil health sampling groups. In the U.S., we go from nearly 24,000 map unit components to four, about 4,600 soil health sampling groups representing all of the area of the contiguous U.S. In Canada, we go from 3,500 map unit components to just over 600 soil health sampling groups. With maps of soil health sampling groups in hand, the next question is wh which soils to prioritize for sampling? With a limited sampling budget, how can we optimize the precision and area of applicability of soil health benchmarks? Several decades of research on the diversity of soil types throughout space have taught us that it's common for a small number of soils to occupy a large proportion of a region. We capitalize on this finding when designing our soil health surveys, first choosing a target proportion of the area of a land use or a crop type to benchmark, and then prioritizing to sample the smallest subset of texture and drainage that we would need to sample to set benchmarks for a target area. Here we'll illustrate this prioritization using the example of the Lower Rio Grande Plain Major Land Resource Area. If we want to set benchmarks for 75% of cropland within the region, we would need to sample 10 map unit components or soil series if we were working directly with a soil survey, but focusing on three soil health sampling groups would allow us to set benchmarks for 81% of cropland. When we do this prioritization procedure for all the major land resource areas of the U.S. and all the ecoregions of Canada, we find that we typically need four or fewer soil health sampling groups to set benchmarks for 75% of the cropland within a region. Of course, the number of soil health sampling groups needed to hit that same target is higher in regions with cropland on a wide range of textures and drainage classes, such as in floodplains. We are currently using soil health sampling groups to help pinpoint the effects of management on soil health in our regional soil surveys, but they can also be used to monitor changes in soil health over time. Using soil health sampling groups rather than map units or soil series to prioritize soils to sample lets us focus on 80 to 90 percent fewer soils while still gaining insights that are applicable over the same area. Soil health sampling groups can also be used to evaluate the feasibility of other aspects of sampling design before sampling begins, for example to estimate the area of different land uses or crop types on the same soils. Finally, soil health sampling groups can help guide recruitment efforts, ensuring that the final data set includes enough similar soils to contextualize results for each location sample. Here I've focused on our general approach to sampling design, but to give you a sense of how we present the results of our benchmarking efforts, I want to introduce you to the concept of the innovation space. This is a way to visualize how potential soil health depends on inherent soil properties or site characteristics within a region. In this example from southern Georgia, we see that the average value we'd expect for soil organic carbon under crop production goes down as sand content increases or as clay content decreases. We use data from perennial systems to quantify the values of organic carbon we would expect, 
when we minimize physical disturbance and maximize time with living roots, which we refer to as the benchmark. The difference between the benchmark and the values we'd expect under, under current crop production is larger for soils with less sand and more clay, meaning there's a larger innovation space or potential to improve soil organic carbon content. Here we have used that same benchmark relationship for southern Georgia to assess how close each location we sampled under cropland is from its soil specific benchmark. We can see that the locations that are closest to their benchmarks have lower tillage intensity. Management factors such as time of living roots and crop rotation are also important and there may be many strategies growers can explore to bring their soil health towards their own goal. Finally, let's take a look at how we can visualize benchmarks for an individual location within a field. This is an example of how we might present data in a report for a farmer who has participated in our regional soil health surveys. The vertical red line shows measured soil organic carbon for a hypothetical soil with 80% sand in southern Georgia. The green box shows the benchmark with uncertainty, or the range of organic carbon values we'd expect on average when the same soil is undisturbed and managed with maximum living roots. The blue box shows the average values of organic carbon we'd expect when the same soil is managed under reduced tillage or no-till with cover crops, and the gold box shows what we'd expect when this soil is managed under conventional tillage or reduced tillage without cover crops. These comparisons allow growers to set their goals for their specific soils based on levels of soil health that are proven to be achievable within, within their region. I appreciate your interest in soil health benchmarking. Please feel free to reach out. Thank you.